It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my first uh, question is uh, to the Minister of Long-Term Care, so perhaps somebody on the government side will be able to respond. Uh, the Long-Term Care Commission report, as we all know, has been public for some time. Uh, the report has some pretty interesting uh, you know, points in it, one of which is, and I quote, 26 residents died due to dehydration prior to the arrival of the Canadian Armed Forces team. They died when all they needed was water and a wipe down. Now that's from the submission that the Canadian Armed Forces report made to the, uh, the Commission. The question that I have for the Minister of Long-Term Care is the same one I asked for over a week now and still have not had an answer to. And the question is when sure. did the Minister of long-term care learn that seniors in our long-term care system were dying from neglect and dehydration. To respond, the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, obviously, once uh, uh, we uh, we've heard of this, we uh, the ministry uh, reached out to the uh, to the commission at the same time. Uh, the chief coroner has been engaged, and we've asked for full documents uh, with respect to uh, all the deaths uh, in long-term care, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And of course, we will be acting on the recommendations of the, of the chief coroner. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, uh, the Globe and Mail has a story uh, today. Uh, that says pretty clearly that those 26 deaths that occurred in a long-term care centre in Downsview, called Downsview Long-Term Care Centre, uh, but those deaths also occurred in other homes. Uh, in fact, the CAF says this in, in their report, uh, COVID fatalities pale in comparison to deaths from other causes, like dehydration, neglect, starvation. Kathy Parks, who lost her father in Orchard Villa uh, to COVID-19, says this, and I quote, If I had my father living at home with me, and I didn't feed him, and I didn't give him water, and I didn't give him medication or sent him to the hospital, I would be criminally charged. So my question to the Minister of Long-Term Care is when did she find out, when did she know that seniors in long-term care in our province Question. here in Ontario were dying of neglect and dehydration. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Again, as I just said, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, once the uh, the final report was issued by the Commission, uh, of course, the Ministry uh, uh, did reach out uh, to the Commission at the same time. Uh, uh, we've, uh, the Chief Coroner has been engaged to look at all, de all deaths uh, in long-term care, as I'm sure all mem members uh, uh, would expect. Uh, uh, once that documentation has been received uh, and, uh, and thoroughly reviewed by both the Coroner and by, by the Ministry, we'll be acting on recommendations that we see. Thank you. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the minister's notebook was obtained by the Commission, and one of the notes uh, that, that was found therein was written by the minister on April 17, 2020. And she wrote, wrote, and I quote, military plan needed, get them in within 24 to 48 hours. So that was on April 17. It took 12 whole days for this, the Canadian Armed Forces to arrive at Hawthorne Place. And in fact, it wasn't until early June that they showed up at Orchard Villa. So my question is, when did the Minister of Long-Term Care learn that Ontario seniors living in long-term care were dying of neglect and dehydration? Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. And, uh, and yes, obviously, we're, we're very grateful uh, for the work that the, uh, the Canadian Armed Forces uh, did in, in assisting us. It's a whole, one of a whole series of measures that the government took uh, uh, during the, the first wave, uh, Mr. Speaker. As you know, it was a very challenging time. Uh, we are, of course, uh, uh, engaged with the, the chief coroner. As members would expect, uh, all deaths uh, in long-term long care homes will be reviewed uh, by, the, by, the, by the chief coroner. Once we uh, seek that uh, additional documentation, Mr. Speaker, we will be taking action. Thank you. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. 
so much, Speaker. My next question is for the Minister of Health. Uh, Speaker, this morning the Financial Accountability Office uh, issued a report that talks about the surgical wait uh, backlog uh, that's waiting here in Ontario. In fact, uh, the uh, Fed, uh, Chief Fed, um, Financial Officer says this. Uh, it's a 419,200 surgical backlog that we have right now in this province, as well as 2.5 million people waiting for diagnostic procedures uh, as of uh, this September alone. Speaker, this is pretty frightening. This is a matter of life and death. These are people who are waiting in pain, anxiety, worry about the procedures that have been postponed uh, and the surgeries that have been postponed. So where is the minister's plan to get rid of, to deal with the surgical and procedural backlogs in our province? Minister of Health, Mr. And thank you to the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question. We are aware that there are a number of surgical procedures and diagnostic procedures and surgeries that have been delayed between uh, the first and second waves and now during this third wave. However, I, it should also be noted that since the beginning of this pandemic, there have been over 420,000 surgeries that have been performed. There is uh, an analysis that is done on anyone with a significant problem, be it cancer care or cardiac care. If they need surgery, if it's a life and death procedure, they will get that surgery. But for other procedures that can be delayed, unfortunately, they have to be. I know this isn't great news for people that have been waiting for a long time, but we simply need the space right now for COVID uh, patients. But we do have a plan. We had a plan since Spons. the beginning of this pandemic, which I'd be pleased to outline in the supplemental speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, 419,200 surgeries is a heck of a lot of surgeries. 2.5 million diagnostic procedures, that's a heck of a lot of procedures. The FAO predicts that it's going to take at least three years, at least three years, uh, to clear these backlogs, the surgery backlog particularly. In British Columbia, 95% of the backlogged uh, surgeries were cleared as of just this past March 2021. The FAO found unfortunately, that instead of spending the money necessary with a real plan to reduce the backlog, this government has been cutting corners and has barely funded half of the necessary resources, the necessary money to clear the backlog. So my question is to the minister, why is she failing to unveil a real plan to clear the backlogs and refusing to invest the necessary money? Minister of Health. Well, in fact, our government does have a plan, and we have committed the resources. The plan has already been indicated to uh, to you as the official opposition and to the people of Ontario. Last fall, we spent uh, an extra $200 million in order to reduce the surgical backlogs. This was increased with our budget this year. A part of our $1.8 billion investment was another $300 million to reduce the backlogs. That's $500 million to engage in surgeries during evenings and on weekends to make sure that we can increase the volume of surgeries we're able to do. We've also set, set out a surgical wait list across uh, a number of hospitals on a regional basis so that we can use every single operating room and that there is a procedure whereby some surgeries can be transferred from one hospital to another if they have the space. We're, we also instituted a surgical smoothing program. Response? All of these programs are working. Uh, we have had to postpone them, but the good news is that our numbers in ICU are at 828 today. That's not a great number by normal standards, but it is going down, and as it goes down... Thank you. Thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Independent Financial Accountability Office has shown in their report this morning that this government is failing to invest the necessary funds by almost double. So if they doubled what they've invested, maybe we'd get some of those surgeries cleared quicker. But you know what that means? Lives will remain on the line here. In fact, folks might remember uh, a woman who was waiting for cancer surgery, and she said this to CTV News, or rather to City News, recently, how she feels with her surgery being um, delayed. It's frustrating. It's terrifying. The government has known for months this was happening. They tailed, uh, tabled a budget that shorted 
the resources necessary to clear the backlogs in surgical procedures and diagnostic procedures. When will the government Question. make the commitment to double the amount that they've invested and ensure that there is a public plan that shows how they're going to get this problem dealt with? Minister of Health. Well, in fact, last year, 88 per cent of our hospitals uh, achieved their surgical targets using the plan that we've already set out, which we will get back to as soon as we're able. But we have put $500 million into just expanding the hours for these surgeries to be done. We've also invested the money to create over 3,400 new beds in hospitals, 285 more uh, uh, intensive care beds. We've also invested more into home and community care, several hundred million dollars, so that those people who don't need to be in hospital can then go home and have the, the procedures and the help that they need, whether it's nursing services or personal support workers. So in addition to the $500 million that I've already discussed, we've put other hundreds of millions of dollars, over $5 billion, into our health care system since the beginning. And while it is very unfortunate, I know people have been waiting Response? for a long time to, to uh, have their surgeries done, this is something we are looking at on a daily basis because we are also anxious to make sure that we can get back to reducing that backlog and getting people back to their normal lives and work. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, when everyone should be doing everything they can to get vaccines to COVID-19 hotspots and to fight vaccine hesitancy, the Conservative government's confusing and mixed messages aren't helping anyone. On Thursday, the Conservative Associate Minister for Small Businesses confused Ontarians by suggesting that the Pfizer vaccine, the same vaccine that Ontario has received over 4.5 million doses of, is not as effective as it could be, despite the fact that the Conservative Associate Minister represents Brampton, a city that is one of the worst hit by the COVID-19 crisis in this entire country, and where folks know they're not receiving as many vaccines as they need to protect lives. Why is the Conservative Associate Minister going out of his way to confuse people about the effectiveness of this vaccine when communities like Brampton need it. To apply the government health I don't think uh, the minister is doing anything of the sort, Mr. Speaker. What the minister uh, uh, is highlighting, and the minister from uh, from Brampton is highlighting the fact that uh, uh, we remain very troubled by the. Uh, uh, the uh, inexcusable reluctance of the federal government to act on our borders, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have uh, highlighted a number of issues with, uh, with borders. We have seen the variants uh, of concern uh, which continue to come through our, our borders. Even this past weekend, a significant more, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is very troubling, and we need the federal government to live up to its responsibility to secure our international borders so that as we continue to hit hot spots like Brampton, which has seen a significant increase in the amount of vaccinations that it has been getting, Mr. Speaker, uh, so that we can continue this good work, we need the federal government to simply step up and do what we have asked it to do, do what everybody is asking it to do, close that border so that we can get these variants of concern under control. And I would ask the member opposite to join with us in this, Mr. Speaker. This is certainly not a partisan issue. We should all be concerned with what we're seeing at our international borders, and I hope that he'll assist us. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Ontarians are smart. They listen to the science. They respect the expert doctors who have told them to take any vaccine available to them. And they know that after this Premier and this Minister for Small Businesses fail to bring in enough paid sick days, fail to protect lives and protect small businesses, that the number one thing that they can do for themselves and their families to stay safe is to get vaccinated. But instead of encouraging people to get vaccinated, the associate minister is confusing people. The Pfizer vaccine isn't the failure. The failure is that the associate minister and the conservative government did not get vaccines into hotspot communities like mine in Brampton. Why is the minister confusing people at this critical time when he could be protecting lives in Brampton by encouraging folks Question. to get vaccinated and by ensuring that we're getting as many vaccine vaccines as possible at this critical time in Brampton? Speaker, I think if there was any failure, it continues to be a failure of the federal government uh, early on to provide us with the vaccines that were needed so that we could do more in, in hot spots, Mr. Speaker. But despite that, Mr. Speaker, despite the failing of the federal government to give us the appropriate vaccines in February, March, 
and April, Mr. Speaker, we have been able to redirect significant vaccinations into hotspots across this province. We have vaccinated over six million people in the province of Ontario. If there is another failing, it's another failing of the federal government which allowed these variants of concerns to get into our borders in the first place. We have been calling on the federal government for months to close down the borders in advance of the UK variant making its way into the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. So I would ask the Honourable Gentleman, if he wants to do the right thing for the people of Brampton, if he wants to help us out in Peel, he can join with us Response. in calling on the federal government to do the right thing, to close our international borders so that we can get control of this situation, because it's not just vaccines, Mr. Speaker, it's about closing access to these variants of concerns. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I want to pick up where the House Leader just left off because it's very clear that stricter border measures help stop the spread of COVID-19 before it even gets here. And we also know that every single case of COVID, has, uh, the variants, have started outside of this province. And as the Solicitor General has said previously, there are yet no COVID variants that have originated from Ontario. So, Speaker, as we begin yet another week with flights coming into Ontario's airports with potentially more variants, my question to the Solicitor General, can the Solicitor General remind this legislature why stronger measures at our borders are essential to help stop the spread of COVID-19? To reply, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the member from Willowdale for right, raising this, because it is critically important that we understand where the variants are coming from and how they get into Ontario. You know, in the last two weeks alone, we've had 43 domestic flights that have had at least one confirmed COVID case on them. And you know how we found that out? Not because the federal government is testing at our airports, but in fact because those individuals, rightfully, went, booked an appointment, got the test, the test came back positive. But Speaker, how many people did they interact with before they got that positive result back? We need to do a better job, and we can do that with our federal partners if they would step up and actually test domestic travelers as they come into Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker. And you know, this is a frustrating issue for me and my constituents. You know, uh, Ontarians continue to make sacrifices uh, to help defeat COVID-19 and, and try and return life back to normal. I mean, in Mother's Day yesterday, Willowdalers made incredible sacrifices and weren't able to celebrate uh, with their families. And, and, and the, the variants are the biggest reason why we can't get back to, to normal life. And, and the Solicitor General and so many members of, of our caucus have been fiercely advocating for these stronger measures at our borders, which we know is going to help stop the spread of these variants in Ontario. So back to the Solicitor General, Speaker. Can she update this House on what the federal government's response to our many letters has been so far? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. And um, yes, unfortunately, I can share with what the federal government responded with. Uh, regrettably, Minister LeBanc refused to address any of the specific concerns that were raised in our letters. First, we called on a ban on all non-essential travel, mandatory PCR testing for interprovincial travelers, an end to the loophole at our land borders, and for proper enforcement of hotel quarantining. You know, Speaker, we continue to be very clear, crystal clear, to the federal government. We're imploring them to take stricter measures at the border. I encourage the Prime Minister to actually read the letters that we've sent and respond with the actions or what they intend to do about it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative government promised Ontarians the best sick day plan in North America. But when they, what they have given us isn't what even people ask for, let alone isn't anywhere near what the best program in Canada would look like. Mr. Speaker, the Yukon gives uh, everyone 10 days of paid leave, no questions asked. Alberta, Saskatchewan, British Columbia all have paid time off for vaccine appointments. PEI and Quebec have permanent paid sick leave programs while ours expire in September, meaning the Conservatives will have taken away five paid sick days from Ontarians by the time their term's up let alone providing the best sick leave. My question is, Mr. Speaker, how does this government ever expect to get this crisis 
in highly impacted places like Scarborough under control with a half-rate bargain sick leave program. Thank you, Speaker. To reply, Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, and I thank the uh, member opposite uh, for that question. Uh, but furthermore, uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member opposite and all members uh, in this legislature for supporting uh, our government's uh, uh, solution to this, to bring forward a comprehensive plan of 23 paid sick days uh, in the province of Ontario. Uh, we uh, committed to uh, doubling the federal program from $500 a week to $1,000 a week and bringing in uh, three paid sick days under the Employment Standards Act. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are the first province uh, in the country to bring in uh, paid sick days during COVID-19. We will continue to stand uh, with workers every single day and all the people of this province until we defeat COVID-19. Supplementary question. Speaker, while this government tries to deflect and distract the public, and, and uses attack ads, really, and then blame the federal government or use the federal government for their excuses. The feds actually wrote back and they asked the province what, the, uh, what they actually wanted to do, and they heard nothing from this government. So my question is again, Mr. Pre Mr. Speaker, when is this government going to stop with the desperate deflection and start focusing on measures that would actually work, something that experts have been calling for, like paid sick days plan, or an actual support program for businesses and workers that actually help these people instead of shutting down businesses and, dr and that this government is dropping the ball on the vulnerable people of this province and our local businesses across this province? When will this government step up and act? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Labour. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are the very first province in Canada to bring forward uh, sick leave during COVID-19, a comprehensive uh, package of 23 uh, paid sick days to help uh, workers and their families uh, get through this pandemic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, all members, including uh, the member opposite, supported uh, our legislation. I'm proud to say that we passed uh, this uh, bill in, in record time, about three hours, Mr. Speaker. So I thank uh, the members of uh, the NDP and, and the independent Liberals for supporting uh, this legislation. But, Mr. Speaker, the federal government has said to us, how can we help? We've got two requests. One, double the uh, four weeks of paid sick leave from $500 a week to $1,000 a week. And secondly, Mr. Speaker, secure our borders, secure our airports, stop the variants of concerns from entering Ontario. If the federal government wants to be a partner, do those two things. Response. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This morning's story in the Globe and Mail about deaths from dehydration in Ontario's long-term care homes is pretty deeply disturbing to all of us. And it's been almost 10 days since the Commission released its report and the government has failed to commit firmly to any of the recommendations in it. I think it's clear to all of us that immediate and sustained action needs to happen. So my question is simple. Through you, Speaker, will the Premier commit to implementing the 85th recommendation of the Long-Term Care Commission's final report, requiring the government to table a report in the Legislature, outlining the progress they've made to implement the remaining recommendations in the report, one year from now, and again in three years from now? A simple answer, yes or no. To reply, Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. appreciate the, the question. Obviously, we uh, take uh, the report very seriously. That's why I would expect the Honourable Member uh, would expect us uh, to take a look at all of the recommendations, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, and give them the, the attention that they deserve. I think what uh, would have been helpful, Mr. Speaker, if had over the 15 years of uh, the previous Liberal government, that's four separate uh, uh, Liberal administrations, had they paid attention to long-term care, had they built long-term care, had they rebuilt some of those, uh, those long-term care homes that were so desperately in need of, uh, of upgrading, had they worked on a staffing strategy, uh, Mr. Speaker, had the Liberals done that for the 15 years and four administrations that preceded ours, we would not have been in the unfortunate position of having to play defense for a full year. But, Mr. Speaker, right now we are on the offense in the province of Ontario. Over 6 million vaccinations doses into people's arms. We're attacking uh, COVID directly in the hot spots. We're going into essential workplaces, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Labour has brought in uh, a sick day regime, Mr. Speaker. We need the federal government to do its part, secure our borders, and we can put this behind us once and for all. The supplementary question. Well, it, Speaker, it's the easiest recommendation in the report for the government to enact right now. I don't know why we couldn't get a yes or a no. 
And last week, when talking about long-term care, the Premier said, and I quote, it was a tragedy, but we're going to fix it. This will never happen again. Never happen again. However, one year ago, the Premier also said an investigation had been launched into the report of the Canadian military. And we found out last week that investigation was never launched. Nothing was ever turned over to police. And then we read in the Globe this morning. And a spokesperson for the Ministry of Long-Term Care says that could be criminal. A year later. Currently, there's no legislative requirement for this government to enact Recommendation 85. This afternoon, I'll be putting forward legislation Question. that will require the government to enact Recommendation 85. Simple question, will the government support that legislation, yes or no? Another simple question. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I said, uh, we will do uh, what's right by uh, long-term care in this province, Mr. Speaker, unlike the previous Liberal government, which he was a member of, Mr. Speaker. Now, there were four previous Liberal administrations in advance of ours, Mr. Speaker, over 15 years. And the record of that previous Liberal government put us on the defence for much of the first part for the first year of this pandemic, whether it was ICU capacity, which they did nothing about, whether it was a staffing strategy for our long-term care homes, whether it was rebuilding long-term care homes that were in desperate need of renovation and upgrading, whether it was adding more long-term care beds, Mr. Speaker. On every single account, the previous four Liberal governments over 15 years failed the people of the province of Ontario. We moved quickly, Mr. Speaker, before the pandemic, whether it was a staffing strategy, whether it was to build thousands of uh, additional long-term care beds, whether it was increasing ICU capacity, increasing Response. testing from 5,000 to 75,000 a day. We are on the offense to put this behind us once and for all, Mr. Speaker. We need the help of the federal government on our borders, but Canadians and Ontarians are on the right. Thank you. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you, Speaker. From the beginning of this pandemic, our government has always put the health and safety of Ontarians as our number one uh, priority, and, and that's what we continue to do. And, Speaker, the people of this province continue to do their part, yet they are unnecessarily put at higher risk because of the lack of border control, Speaker, the higher risk coming into our country, into our province, from these dangerous variants from uh, travellers, both internationally and domestically. Speaker, we have all heard the success around other places in the world, like New Zealand, and how they've managed uh, to, to fare COVID-19 by restricting travel. My question is to the Solicitor General. It was very disappointing to hear that our letters had little uh, response or good response from the federal government. So my question is, what other steps is our government taking to urge Ottawa to finally get serious question. about protecting our borders? The Solicitor General. Thank you, and thank you again for the member from Willowdale. I know that this is an important issue for your constituents and your community, but it is for all of Ontario. Since December, Premier Ford has been urging the Prime Minister to take stronger actions at our border. That's why Ontario has the first jurisdiction to actually implement on-arrival COVID testing for international travellers, leading the federal government to take the action on this front. We also took the unprecedented step of closing the Manitoba and Quebec uh, borders, land and water, with the provinces. As the member will know, we have sent Order. three separate letters to Minister Blair and the federal government asking them to take action to protect Ontario citizens. Unfortunately, the response we received from the federal government has said they still refuse and will be continuing to ignore uh, taking response. action to limit international travel. Completely unacceptable, Speaker. And supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. And, and it's truly frustrating to, to hear the federal government's lack of, of action to protect our border, Speaker. And my constituents are extremely frustrated also. Uh, to paraphrase one of my constituents from the other day, these variants are not swimming into Ontario. Speaker, we know these variants of concerns are now the dominant form of the virus in our country. And when it comes to international travel, border protection is a federal duty, and they have a responsibility to protect Willowdalers and all Ontarians. Speaker, back to the minister. Can she please explain why strict measures at our borders are essential to protect Ontarians from these dangerous variants of concern? Mr. Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, we've seen how limiting international travel has been used 
effectively to spread the uh, COVID-19 variant. We all know of the success of the maritime bubble in limiting travel and by doing so limiting COVID cases. No one argues. We all understand. But let's take a look here in Canada. In Canada, the federal government allows international travel in four provinces, Ontario, Quebec, Alberta, BC. We all know there are a lot of factors in, at play with COVID spread, but it is a factor in provinces that have the hardest battle with COVID since this began that the same provinces have the international travel. It's not a coincidence. Even the restrictions on those traveling from hotspots like India mean it only takes two mouse clicks for someone to route a flight through another country to arrive at Toronto Pearson. The federal government needs to take Response. this issue seriously to protect us from the variants. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Nowhere, nowhere was COVID had been more deadly than our long-term care homes. We saw it clearly in Niagara. Des despite the Premier's promise to build an iron ring around long-term care in the first wave of COVID, more seniors died in the second wave than the first. Mothers, fathers, grandparents, Love, love members of our community. At Oakwood Park Lodge in Niagara Falls, nearly 100% of the staff and residents were infected. 40 people died. The Long-Term Commission confirmed what we all knew. This government failed long-term care residents. In Niagara, people died as the government refused to send in the military or the Red Cross help the staff, which I asked for. The report says it clearly. The Premier had no plan to protect these seniors or staff. Speaker, will the Premier admit he failed long-term care residents and staff and admit that Niagara was left without proper government support and immediately implement the Commission's recommendation? Government House Leader. Speaker, uh, and as I said on a number of occasions, we'll certainly take a be reviewing all of the uh, the very important recommendations uh, that came through the uh, the commission report, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, honourable members on both sides of the house would expect uh, uh, nothing uh, nothing less, uh, Mr. Speaker. But as I said on a number of occasions, we certainly were faced with uh, some challenging situations when we inherited government after four previous uh, Liberal administrations, which had not. Uh, done the work needed to uh, uh, invest in our long-term care homes, whether it was a staffing strategy, Mr. Speaker. We know staff was leaving, but we didn't know why they were leaving. Was it pay? Was it other issues? Our homes were in disrepair. They had made no, no progress on, on helping on that file. There was wait lists, uh, multi-year wait lists in many homes because the Liberals simply did not invest in new homes, Mr. Speaker. We took action right away in advance, Mr. Speaker. We knew we knew that more had to be done in long-term care. That's why we made investments almost immediately to upgrade our long-term care homes, to build thousands of new homes, Mr. Speaker. We are making progress on the file, and I think members would expect nothing less. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We saw how much our, more deadly the second wave of COVID was in Niagara. Despite this government's having time to prepare, their promise to protect seniors and staff in long-term care facilities. Long-term care commission report showed us that 26 seniors died of neglect, desperately needing water, and a wipe down. Think of that. They died because they couldn't get water. Water. The premier promised an investigation into these deaths. Now he says he won't launch one. Like the iron ring he promised, his investigation was a myth. He wouldn't commit to implementing the recommendations in the report either. Enough of blaming others. Thousands of seniors have died under this government's watch. This premier and his government failed the residents of Ontario. Speaker, will the premier fully and immediately implement all of the recommendations in the commissioner's report? Will he ensure, will he ensure homes are properly staffed and no other senior dies in the richest province in Canada because they couldn't get water. House Leader. Again, Mr. Speaker, I think the Honourable Member will agree that significant progress has been made, and he's absolutely correct uh, that uh, this, uh, this province was left in a very challenging situation after four previous Liberal administrations and the lack of investment that we saw in them, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that is why this government has committed to uh, four hours of, uh, of care. It's a multi-billion dollar uh, uh, investment, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I suspect uh, individuals don't care how much it, it costs, they just want to ensure that it gets done. That's why, in addition to that, we're going to be hiring 27,000 
some additional PSWs. We heard from, uh, from, uh, from the PSWs themselves in advance of the last election that they wanted an organization to, uh, 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 and, uh, to cover and to allow them to advocate for themselves. That is before the House right now, Mr. Speaker. We are building thousands of new homes across uh, the province. We've increased infection uh, prevention and control measures. The Response? move to Ontario health teams is another significant, significant milestone and breakthrough in how we can ensure that our homes stay safe. So the member is right. Work had to have been done over the last 15 years of the previous four Liberal administrations, but we're getting it done. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, one of the undeniable impacts of the COVID pandemic is that women have been disproportionately affected. Everyone has experienced major isolating changes in their lives, but women working with the elderly, holding the front line in businesses deemed essential, caring for babies, working at their own jobs from home, and homeschooling their children have often carried a double load. So much so, Mr. Speaker, that thousands of women have actually left the labour force in order to manage the demands of their families. This is a reality, uh, and, that, and the economic downturn brought on by COVID has been called the she-session by some economists. It's the reason that if we are to successfully recover as a society, we need to recognize that we must foster a she-covery. The most important thing that we can do is make sure that women can re-enter the workforce when they're ready to do so and have someone to look after their children. Speaker, the federal government has offered to invest in childcare across the country to enhance and build on the services already available in provinces and territories. Will the Premier work with the federal government to ensure that every family in Ontario who needs affordable childcare for their children will find it in their own community? To reply, the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member, for that question. Obviously, it's one that we uh, hold near and dear to our heart as well. Ontario is committed to building an affordable childcare system that is flexible and responsive to the needs of families and um, you know, very unique families. And I can tell you from every roundtable that I've heard, I always heard from women about the issues and barriers that childcare face. So it is very important to us. We hope that the federal government will significantly step up their funding to advance affordability while agreeing that parents need a flexible system that responds to their preferences on how to raise their children. As we know, a one-size approach does not fit all. We look forward to reviewing the details of the plan, and as we have done before, our government is again providing direct relief to families to help offset additional costs incurred as a result of the pandemic, and payments to parents through the Ontario COVID Child Benefit Response. being on April 26 to help working parents of students aged 0 through grade 12 will direct, with direct financial supports during the pandemic. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the, uh, the, the minister's answer. Um, speaker, between 2008 and 2018, our government built 200,000 childcare spaces, and the number of children in licensed childcare in Ontario doubled in that period. Ontario Liberals have put forward a plan that would partner with the federal government to build on that progress and provide licensed, affordable childcare across Ontario. And licensed childcare can be flexible, to the minister's point. It can be home-based. And with the support of the federal government, it can be affordable for every family. Speaker, I suspect that there's an ideological antipathy toward childcare in this government. We saw that on display during the last election when the leader demonstrated that he knew nothing about how childcare operated on Ontario. But, Speaker, the need to address this issue is more acute than it has ever been. COVID demands that we recognize the labour market participation by women will not recover without a new commitment to childcare. I ask again whether this government will put aside that ideological opposition and develop a process Question. to work with the federal government to make sure that child care is available to every family who wants it and needs it in Ontario. And to respond, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, just building off, my colleague indeed will work with the federal government. We all aspire to make childcare accessible and affordable and flexible for working parents in the province. However, we, uh, as we reflect and look back, it is it must be noted, Speaker, that Ontario, under the former Liberal government, had the second highest and most expensive childcare system in the nation. It's not a program we seek to emulate. We have chosen to directly support parents with the child care tax credit. We topped it up in the most recent budge budget by an additional 20 per cent of one-time support, given the unique challenges facing parents, especially women, given that their uh, difficulty re-entering the labour market as a consequence of the disruption of the pandemic. We've increased supports in the child care system. There's over $2 billion being expended every single year 
uh, with a plan to build 30,000 spaces within our schools. Last year, 16,000 spaces were created within the child care market. We know there's more to do. It's why in our budget we increase supports, and we're going to continue in collaboration with the federal government to work with them to make child care more accessible for all Ontarians. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you, Speaker. We know that stricter border measures stop the spread of COVID-19. That's a fact, and it's backed up by science and data, and our respected allies around the world have implemented them with great success. So while our government continues to urgently request real action to secure our borders, based on the Solicitor General's previous two answers, it's clearly not a priority for the Prime Minister. What's even more disappointing, what's frankly astonishing, Speaker, is to see that the Liberal Party leader, Stephen Del Duca, and his party are more interested in defending their federal cousins than taking time to stand up for Ontarians. So, Speaker, my question is for the Solicitor General. Can the Minister tell this House if Mr. Del Duca's claims that this government's policy on securing our borders is somehow xenophobic or an attack on Ontarians? Okay. Solicitor General. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the, uh, the interest and the back and forth because I think this is an important issue for all of us to appreciate and understand. We know from aviation statistics that the vast majority of air travellers to Ontario are, in fact, domestic travellers. During March of 2021, our hardest hit month so far in Ontario, more than 21,000 travellers passed through the Ottawa airport alone, which we know only accepts domestic travellers. To give you an idea of how many people that is, it would be the equivalent of the city of Brockville passing through the airport in just one month. Speaker, do you know how many of those travelers were required by the federal government to get tested? Zero. None. It's shameful that anyone, let alone the leader of a party, would make this about race. Perhaps Mr. Del Duca should spend less time standing up for his federal cousins and spend some time Response. standing up for Ontarians. And the supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate that response from the minister because I agree this has nothing to do with race, and it's unfortunate to hear the Liberal members heckle during uh, the question about this very important issue, Speaker, because I think all Ontarians have made incredible sacrifices, and Ontarians also know that after over a year of the pandemic, there should be some sort of safeguards put in place. So why won't Mr. Del Duca join us in asking his federal co cousins to protect the borders here in Ontario? It's a simple request. So, Speaker, back to the minister. Is there a reason to be concerned about travellers, even from within our country? Mr. General. That would be an emphatic yes, Speaker. Ontarians are frustrated. They're doing their part and they're following public health advice. Meanwhile, Mr. Del Duca's federal cousins refuse to act even after three official requests for action. Premier Ford has repeatedly asked the federal government to step up and do the right thing. We need to ensure that our borders are secure. Did you know that a population larger than the entire city of Kitchener passed through Pearson Airport in February alone? The vast majority were not even required to take a PCR test. Does Mr. Del Duca's party think that the most travellers should not be tested? Or will he and the members opposite join us in calling the federal government to implement PCR testing for all air travellers? Or will they continue to their spending their time standing up for their federal cousins instead of doing what's right for the people of Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, on Friday, April 30th, the Minister of Colleges and Universities released a statement that said, I'm quoting here, the government's priority is to maintain a northern and bilingual midwifery program. And that got a lot of traction in the news and on social media. And many people reached out to my office to say that Laurentian University's midwifery program had been saved. However, shortly afterwards, a ministry spokesperson clarified that the province was not saying it would be able to preserve Laurentian's midwifery program, but that it would be making efforts. And they provided zero information on how that would happen. Speaker, that was a cruel joke to play in Northern Ontario. Will the Premier commit today to ensuring that a tricultural bilingual midwifery program in Northern Ontario will exist this fall? Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, and Parliamentary Assistant. 
Thank you, Speaker. And, and Speaker, yes, we remain committed to these programs in the North. That's why, Speaker, as the Premier and, and Minister have said, we've worked with impacted students, the 10 percent affected by the CCAA proceeding, to ensure pathways to graduation, worked closely with institutions to ensure midwifery programming remains in the North, uh, bilingual remains in the North for students to graduate and practice uh, their practice within the North. And we'll continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the Premier. Speaker, for nearly two decades, Laurentian University's physics department graduated 15 radiation therapists each and every single year. These are the students that go on to operate the machines used in radiation therapy for cancer patients. However, Speaker, because the Premier failed to protect Laurentian University from the CCAA process, the medical physicists who provided training in radiation therapy have lost their jobs. This means that the four-year program to train radiation therapists in Northern Ontario no longer exists. According to the CBC, the Ministry of Health has referred questions about this to the Minister of Colleges and University. Then the Ministry of Colleges and Universities referred it back to the Ministry of Health. Speaker, the midwifery, midwifery and radiation therapy for cancer patients are two programs essential to healthcare care in Northern Ontario. Will the Premier do the right thing and commit to saving these programs in Northern Ontario? Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, our government's been clear from day one. Our universities, our colleges, our universities are autonomous institutions governed by their own board of uh, directors, Mr. Speaker. When one asks to go before a judicial proceedings, the CCAA, uh, we respect that. We respect the independence of that process. What we've done is we've ensured that students have a pathway to graduation, Mr. Speaker. We've ensured that we have midwifery programming in the north, thanks to additional investments from this government. We've expanded front programming in the north thanks to investments from this government we've seen it with nausum we've seen it with Hearst, mr speaker but what's really deeply concerning from the member opposite he wants politicians to interfere in what autonomous university what courses they offer he wants politicians to interfere in in legal uh, court proceedings, Mr. Speaker, and it's, it's, it's chilling, really. That's why that party opposite has only had one opportunity to govern, Mr. Speaker. If he wants to interview for Minister of Thought Spons. Control, Mr. Speaker, that's up to him. But this government's going to respect the independent proceedings, and we're going to support our students in the North. Sure. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question's uh, for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Premier and his party have launched attacks against the federal government that are xenophobic and outrageous. They're claiming that it's the federal government failure at the border that is the cause of all of our COVID-19 problems. The Premier has said he wants to see fewer people enter Ontario, but he won't tell us who. Okay, just a sec. I, I need to be able to hear the question. Member for Orléans has the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Premier has told us that he wants to see fewer people enter Ontario, but he won't tell us who. Does he want to stop truck drivers from delivering essential goods? Does he want to stop doctors and nurses from crossing the border to work at hospitals? Does he want to stop the 30,000 international students that were accepted into our publicly funded uh, universities, Mr. Speaker? Now, today the government claims that they're talking about restrictions on domestic travel, and they've closed the borders Question. with Ontario and Quebec. And since they're doing such a good job, at domestic travel restrictions, Mr. Speaker. Perhaps the minister can tell us how many people traveled from Gatineau into Ottawa this morning. The Solicitor General. I'm, I'm shocked, Speaker. I, I can't believe the member opposite has not been listening to the back and forth about what we have been doing and what we will continue to do. To be clear, we want to stop the variants of concern coming into Ontario. That is what is going to protect us. That is what is going to give us the time to vaccinate enough people to protect our citizens. If the member understood that the vast majority of positive cases right now are actually variants that originate from somewhere outside of Ontario, perhaps he could work with us and our federal partners to do the right thing and close the borders, test people, and get the hotel to the land and water um, loopholes solved. That would be productive use of your time. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just to be clear, the minister doesn't know how many people traveled from Gatineau to Ottawa this morning, despite the fact that there's an interprovincial uh, restriction. The province is on lockdown. 
thousands of new COVID-19 cases every day, over 800 Ontarians in critical care. Schools and outdoor recreation remain closed, and a lack of centralized booking has led to a scramble to find uh, and receive vaccinations. But instead of focusing on solving these issues, Mr. Speaker, instead of spending their time getting vaccines into arms, advertising about vaccine hesitancy, Order. the government is focusing their attention on blaming others. They're not advertising about stopping the spread of the virus. They're not advertising to combat vaccine hesitancy. They're not advertising about the ways in which they're helping Ontarians. They're advertising and fundraising with the all too familiar refrain of blaming others. Those people from over there, Mr. Speaker, it's those people from over there. If only fewer of them were coming in, Question. all of our problems would be solved. So, Mr. Speaker, when will the government put the focus on helping Ontarians and stop trying to animate their base with Doug Whistle politics? I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. I withdraw. To reply, the Solicitor General. So many issues. So, first of all, I am going to reinforce that the vast majority of variants of positive cases of COVID-19 are, in fact, the variants of concern, which, by extension, means that those variants came from other countries. Right now, that happens to be a variant that started in the UK. But we all know and are watching what's happening with our BC and Alberta counterparts, where they are seeing variants coming from other countries. We need to stop that. We can do all the vaccine, vaccinations that, that we can based on the supply, and we will continue to do that. We've expanded the pharmacy model. We've expanded the primary care model. We have 34 public health units doing excellent work across Ontario, making sure that, to date, over Response. 6 million people, that's almost half of the province, have received the vaccine. So, while that rollout will continue, and we're very proud of the work that they are doing, we also need to focus on making sure that no more variants come into Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Next question. The member for York Southwestern. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Um, my question is to the Premier. The third wave has been devastating to York Southwestern, a community of essential workers and marginalized populations. As a high risk and hot spots, we need to make to make a priority for vaccinations. And so far, we have few mobile pop-ups and no permanent facility or location. And now this week, our residents are forced to travel outside of the community for any hope of getting their vaccine. Our residents are looking for the government to provide the health care they need right here, right now, in the community. Workers need adequate basic days as well as part-time off to get their vaccinations they are waiting for. When is this government going to act with urgency when it comes to stopping COVID transmission in our community? To reply, the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, and I thank the uh, member uh, opposite for the opportunity to get up and, and talk about what we're doing uh, for workers in this province. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we were the very first uh, province in Canada uh, since COVID-19 uh, hit this country to bring in a comprehensive 23 uh, days of paid sick leave uh, for workers, a combination of uh, the federal government's uh, program and ours. But, Mr. Speaker, I'm extremely proud of our worker income protection benefit. Uh, it does not require uh, a sick note from doctors, and it uh, ensures that workers uh, stay home if they're feeling unwell, if they are getting a COVID test and waiting for uh, COVID results, if a worker has to go and get vaccinated, or if a worker has to stay home and recover from uh, a vaccination. But, Mr. Speaker, we go even further. If there's workers out there uh, being impacted by COVID-19, uh, sorry, by uh, mental health issues related to COVID-19, uh, they can stay home and be paid for that. If you're a mom or a dad that has to stay home because your child has uh, COVID symptoms, stay home and get paid. Supplementary. Thank you. Again, uh, my question is to the Premier. High risk and hot spots like York Southwestern, that is home to so many essential workers, need to be not treated 
like an afterthought by this government. I have been approached by essential businesses who would like to get their essential workers vaccinated right at their workplace but cannot afford to cover the cost of arranging for that, Mr. Speaker. Why is this government not making it easier for workplaces to vaccinate their employees on the spot? And why is this government not working with these essential businesses, help vaccinate workers and mitigate COVID transmission, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and I'm, uh, I'm actually really glad that the, the member opposite raised this because uh, it's very exciting. One of the other pathways for individuals to get vaccinated is mobile mini-vaccination sites that are moving into some of the areas and smaller businesses that do not have the facility or the bandwidth to put on their own uh, vaccination clinic. So in fact, we have ramped up with the help of uh, Red Cross and Menabe to actually have teams go out and go to those smaller businesses, and I hope that the member opposite would share the names of those businesses with us so that we can reach out, connect, and make sure that that is available to them and their employees. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Recently, the Premier stated that he believes that if the borders were safe, everything would be fine right now. But back in March of last year, when there were less than 200 cases of COVID in Ontario, the Premier encouraged families to travel for March break and stated that he wanted the borders to remain open. If it's true that border measures might have helped stop the spread of COVID, it's logical that it would have only helped way back when there were only a few cases of COVID in Ontario and none of the variants had arrived. So then why? Did the Premier not call for these measures 14 months ago when things could have been prevented? Order. The response, the Solicitor General. Well, the, the member opposite raises an important um, piece of information, and that is the more that we learn about COVID-19, how it spreads, why it spreads, where it's spreading from, the more we can protect people. And it is absolutely critical, as we understand more about COVID-19, that we continue to learn, that we continue to pivot, and we continue to put more uh, additional enforcement in. You know, I, I would remind the member that it was actually Premier Ford and our government who started testing international visitors in uh, the beginning of this year because, you know, we, we all remember that long-term care home in Barrie that was devastated because of one person who was carrying the variant from the UK, infected, and then unfortunately devastated a long-term care home. When we learn that Response. information, we have to be able to react quickly to ensure that uh, others are protected. And that's what we've done by, by uh, asking for additional border restrictions and putting, imposing more border restrictions on Manitoba and Quebec. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Speaker, the Premier had 14 months to ask the federal government to do something on border controls, but the Premier blew it. He was too busy praising instead. Last August, the Premier stated, you wonder why I'm always up here praising him? Because he did an incredible job as Prime Minister. The Prime Minister responded with, it is always great to be up here with friends, especially you, Premier Ford. Then the Premier called Liberal Finance Minister Christa Freeland amazing. She previously called the Premier her therapist. If the Premier had such a glowing friendship with Prime Minister Trudeau and such influence over Finance Minister Freeland, why didn't the Premier take the opportunity to task for the border measures he wanted 14 months ago, back when no variants had arrived in Canada and COVID cases were close to zero by comparison? In other words, back when it may have made a difference. And to respond, the Solicitor General. Oh, Speaker. So, when COVID-19 came in last year, it came in from another country. Order. Right? The variants came in from another country. We look at what the maritime bubble did. It was a very successful model. They protected their borders. We've done that. We proactively, when the federal government wasn't testing international visitors, we stepped up and we did that. Now, to their credit, the federal government, after a number of weeks, did actually take over PCR testing of international visitors. 
All we are asking for is that they do the same for the domestic visitors because we have those essential people coming into Ontario, we have citizens returning to Ontario, and all we want to do is protect them to make sure that we don't have more spread and a fourth wave. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last week I wrote a letter to the Minister of Finance highlighting some concerns on the state of our auto insurance system in Ontario and in Brampton North. I wrote how in Ontario we pay some of the highest auto insurance rates in the country, twice as much as our neighbours in Quebec pay on average. I also informed the Minister that my constituents of Brampton North pay the highest auto insurance premiums in the province, with an average of $3,301 per year more than twice the provincial average of $1,616. We also know there have been fewer drivers and fewer accidents on the road during this pandemic. Insurance companies have raked in record profits, but the drivers of Ontario have not seen any meaningful rebates. As the official opposition has recommended, will this government implement a 50% decrease on auto insurance payments during this pandemic and allow payment deferrals for those who have lost their jobs in these times of economic uncertainty. The parliamentary assistant and member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I appreciate the member from Brampton North raising this very important issue. And as the member will understand from the foundational briefing provided to him through the Ministry of Finance, this is a very complex issue because we have an auto insurance system that is overly complicated and full of conflict, created actually uh, by the NDP Speaker. And that means we have to tackle this problem in a fundamental way, going after the root problems, increasing competition, get rid of, uh, getting rid of the conflict in the system, and attracting new entrants into the market by allowing for the use of technology, such as user-based insurance, UBI. And I'm proud to say that Travelers Insurance recently has announced a new product, Order. which will bring down rates for the great drivers of, of Brampton. Speaker, Our message to the ratepayers of Brampton and across this province is very clear. The NDP created this mess. We're going to fix it. That concludes question period for this morning. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 286, an act to amend the Safe Drinking Water Act 2002 to require specified actions with respect to safe drinking water for Ontarians living and working on reserves. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to please prepare the lobbies.